Okay, welcome back, folks, to another lecture of CSSE 332 in week eight is what we are now. So it's been a it's been a, a while. Um, so today we're gonna um, hopefully wrap up our discussion of um, um, threads, deadlocks, finish up where we left off on yesterday, and then we're gonna start talking about segmentation as the next step after this um, after today. Few announcements before we, we get started. Um, exam two makeup is going to be on Friday. Um, I will send you more information. I am almost done with grading exam two, um, so you should be able to get your your grades hopefully either tonight or tomorrow morning. The latest, I should uh, send out your grades, and you would you would be able to make the decision whether you want to take the makeup exam um, or not. Um, second of all, apologies for not posting um, the links to the slides and activities and clear money questions for yesterday's session. Um, that completely skipped my mind, so um, I, I fixed that on the course website. Um, so you can submit last two sessions activities tomorrow at 2. Um, we're going to solve yesterday's activity today. If we don't get through the entire material today, then um, what's going to happen is that we're going to shift the activity for this session from today, from tomorrow till after Thursday. So basically that just, um, I'll, I'll tell you um, what happens at the end of the session, depending on how much we, we cover. All right, questions? Okay. Um, before we jump into talking about yesterday's uh, discussion and going forward, we I just wanted to go over the results of the anonymous reviews or the anonymous um, survey that I did at the end of um, Project Milestone 2. Yeah, so um, you all got the 10 points for free because basically um, it was anonymous, so I have no idea who submitted and who didn't. So, but I just wanted to encourage you um, to, to submit those um, surveys. So you all got the 10 points for that. Um, survey and thank you for the 16 groups that did submit um, the, uh, the survey. Um, for the difficulty, um, I expected that we would be somewhere. I honestly expected somewhere here, which is basically what 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 we had, right? Somewhere between four and a five um, in terms of the difficulty. So that was okay. Um, it's a project milestone, so um, it it's, it carries its weight since it has a lot of weight on. Um, on your grade. Uh, for the quality of learning, um, this was mixed. So as, assuming for assuming three is average, like not so good, not so bad. Um, I'm OK. I'm glad that we got the majority of the class to go three and above. Um, so um, I hope this was rewarding for you when, when doing this assignment for those of you who um, enjoyed it. For the people who thought it was, um, in terms of learning, of, of getting to know new things, who thought it wasn't that good. So um, my apologies. We will try to fix that um, as we go on. So we, I am learning as you all are. Um, we're trying to adapt the um, project and the milestones as we go forward. So we'll try to make those um, more clear and increase or enhance your learning in those um, activities. Um, I had a few comments. So I, again, for the quality of the support, I'm glad we're on this hemisphere. Um, but I had a few comments about the level of depth in the um, in the documentation and in the instructions themselves. So I'm not sure exactly what you guys are expecting to have in the documentation. Sometimes I intentionally leave things vague because I want you to think of a, of a solution and not just follow the instructions I give you to come up with a solution. Um, so if you have any comments on to add on to that, um, I welcome any comments now in class or um, you can just shoot me an email. There's no consequences to that. I will not penalize anyone. I actually prefer to have that comment um, so that I could adjust milestone three to avoid any of these cases. So does anyone have any comments they'd like to share with us um, in class today? Okay, 
So if you have comments um, following up on that, then please send me an email or shoot me a text message, a, a state Teams message, and I can take that into consideration when um, developing Limestone 3. Um, so here's how I interpreted the results from the sum from the from the project um, review. And here's how what here's the stuff. Here are the steps that I will take when writing Milestone 3. So uh, I will be more explicit and direct in the places where I have to be explicit and direct. So in the places where I need you, uh, where I ask you to follow instructions, I will clearly and as clearly as I can state those instructions, state the API calls, and put links to um, any APIs or documentations that um, follow up with those. In the places where I intentionally leave things vague, I will mention explicitly say, in this section, you have to design your own solution. So that I intentionally have left things vague for you. So you go and then and think about the solution. So here's an example of that. Um, in the last part of the milestone, we had the process of killing a uh, the, the objective of killing a process that lives in the in the in the kernel for more than 50 seconds. So that's all I said in the project description, right? Because I wanted you to use the previous four or five steps to actually implement this. So there are certain w different ways where you could implement this. You could either um, use a timer for each process. Right, each process has a timer of 50 seconds. You could um, timestamp when the process starts, and then every time your original timer goes off, if it's been 50 seconds since that time, you kill the process. Right? You could add another timer that is global, but that checks on all the times of the processes. So there were multiple ways in which to solve this, and I wanted you to think of your own solution um, and implement your own solution to this problem. Um, and when it comes to design problems, I will make sure in Mindstone 3 to actually say specifically, this is a design problem. You have to design your own solution. Um, and then that, that's that's why intentionally things are a little bit fixed. Um, I had have, I have also another comment on that the Mindstone was a little bit divorced from the class material. I take that and I will try to make it more attached. Here's what I think is relevant to the class material in Milestone 2. So the things that you did are accessing the PCB of your um, kernel. This is the actual PCB that the Linux kernel uses. So now if you want, if you're writing a read, a, a read handler, you know how to get the PCB of the process that's calling. You have seen the values that the process that the PCB contains. And you have a lot of you have used um, a few of those um, information in, in the pro process control block. We um, also learned how to use timers and um, signals inside of the Linux kernel, which um, was something that we did in user space only before. So those two things are things that we're extending from our user space threads and processes, um, uh, assignments from before, and then doing them in the kernel. So how is Milestone 3 going to relate to the class material? There is a chunk of class material that we did not quiz you or test you on, which was scheduled, right? So Milestone 3 is actually going to take the FIFO scheduler and the multi-level feedback queue scheduler that we introduced in that scheduling session, and we're going to actually implement them. But instead of implementing them in user space, we're going to implement those in the in a kernel module. So this way, you actually take it, um, you solidify your understanding of the scheduling um, part of the class. Questions? So that's how I will organize uh, Milestone 3. Um, there will be a checkpoint in about a week after, um, after I launch it, where you just implement the FIFO scheduler. This is, this is mostly going to be guided, where I tell you do this, do that, um, write the logic in here, um, here's the functions, and so on. And then the second part in the MLF queue, you're probably going to be on your own, right? Um, it's just extending your FIFO queue into a multi-level feedback. All right. Questions? Okay. All right. So before we get to finally getting rid of our semaphores and deadlocks and threads and all of that, 
There was one more problem that we were um, talking about yesterday that we haven't completed. So let me remind you what the cigarette smokers problem was. So we had one agent that was composed of three agents. We had three smokers, each with a certain kind of ingredient. And in total, we have three ingredients, tobacco, paper, and matches. Each one of the smokers has one of the three, and they need the other two to roll and smoke a cigarette. The agent is composed of three logical agents. Each one of those agents only puts out two of those ingredients at a time. So two of the three ingredients is put out by the agent at one time. And we saw that the problem, because we were having two semaphores raised at the same time or posted to at the same time, we were waking up two or more smokers and those smokers were causing a deadlock. OK, so what do you think we can do to resolve this deadlock to make sure that um, we don't enter a state where all the smokers are waiting? Yeah. I, I was thinking of this when I was looking at it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's like the future purpose. Yeah. Of it. But like, don't you just have like agent A, which makes the back on the paper only yeah. if it's items to matches? Okay. So, so like make it a semaphore for the back of the paper and matches. And yeah. Only post to matches after agent A runs. Yeah. Yeah. So we need something. The, the place we're going is that eventually we only want to wake up one smoker at a time, right? And that's eventually where we're going to head into um, in this in this um, in this solution. But since we're not, we don't want to change the agent code. We're going to add three what we call pushers, and those pushers are going to do exactly. Um, what Andrew was suggesting. They're going to see what ingredients we have on the table, and then they're going to wake up one of the smokers. But before we do that, let me give you a little bit of historical context uh, on onto this smoker's problem. So this was suggested in back in the 60s to basically tell Dijkstra, who invented semaphores, that semaphores can't solve all problems. Here's a problem that semaphores alone cannot solve. So if you just don't allow people to add these pushers, if I just want to use three semaphores, the agents and the tobacco smokers or the smokers, there is no way you can solve this problem. All right, with just the semantics of wait on a semaphore, post to a semaphore, there is no way you can solve this problem without weights. So that was the pro that was the original paper that proposed this problem said that you can't really um, solve all concurrency problems with semaphores. Then came another paper that said, well, actually you can, but you need to add these, whoops, these pushers in here. So that's a little bit of history into how this, this problem came along. And let's see what the solution they proposed was. So they proposed that, let's assume we have um, paper or we have tobacco, and matches produced. What our code is going to do is that instead of waking up all of the smokers, we're going to wake up for the tobacco, we're going to wake up a thread called tobacco pusher. And for the matches, we're going to wake up a thread called matches pusher. And here's what the pushers do. So imagine we have a table where we put the ingredients on. OK, so if the tobacco pusher is the first one to run, so the table is empty, the matches pusher has not run yet, all it's going to do, it's going to put the tobacco on the table. So basically, it's just going to have a Boolean value that says have tobacco equals to true. So put 
the tobacco on the table. If there was, so basically second, if you are the second one to run, which means that there is an ingredient on our table, we look at that ingredient. If it's um, paper, if the ingredient on the paper, if the ingredient on the table is paper, and we're gonna put tobacco, then we're gonna wake up smoker with matches. Okay, so I as a pusher get up from sleep. I look at the table. If there's nothing on the table, I just put the ingredient on the table. If there's something on the table, if I am a tobacco pusher, if that thing is paper, this means that I have to wake up the smoker with the matches. If that thing on the table is matches, then we have tobacco, we have matches, so we need to wake up the smoker with the papers. OK. So the same thing is going to happen for the matches pusher. Oops. If I am the first one to wake up, I just say have matches be true. So put the matches on the table. If the table is not empty, if there's paper on the table, so we have paper, we have matches, we should wake up the tobacco smoke. And then if it's matches on the table, or uh, not matches, we can't have matches. If it's tobacco, then we have tobacco, we have matches, then we have to wake up the, um, we have tobacco and matches, wake up the paper smoke. Okay. So what are the two possibilities that can happen when we have tobacco and matches on um, produced by the agent? So what do you think, which of these two branches are possible or which of these branches are possible? Yeah. Yes, tobacco and matches are on. Yeah, so we can either have tobacco be the first one up. So we put the tobacco on the table first. This means that the matches scheduler or the matches um, pusher is going to go into this branch. The other possibility is we actually do this first. Then the tobacco pusher is going to wake up see that there are matches on the table, and we're going to take this branch. And eventually, you can see that we wake up the same smoker. So no matter what we do, we only wake up one smoker at a time, and thus we avoid the deadlock. OK, so that concludes our discussion of semaphores, threads, deadlocks, and all of that. The activity that we launched yesterday, um, you can submit that by, by class time tomorrow. Um, so you just have to implement um, this part um, in, in, your, in your own code. Okay, and as a hint, you're gonna need three more semaphores more than the ones we have. All right, questions before we uh, move on to talking about memory. Yeah. When you say wake up, is like so the tobacco push and everything like that, is its own thread? Yes. So when I say wake up, it means that the pusher is waiting on a semaphore and you just post to that semaphore. Okay. So basically you can you can see it here as post to tobacco 
or shared server. And the same thing goes for the other. So you might you, you're going to need uh, three semaphores for the pushers, three semaphores for the smokers, and then you, you move on. Other questions? OK. So let's go back to our slides, talk a little bit about the learning objectives for today in the next few lectures. Um, so to, in, in the class today, what we're going to do is we're going to restart our discussion or open the chapter that talks about virtual. And in order to do that, we're going to start with the easy steps. What we're going to do today is we're going to define what the address space of a process actually means. Right, but we've been talking about the process address space and another process address space. We're going to actually define what an address space is. And we're going to take a look at one of the most important roles of the operating system, which is to be an illusionist. And that means um, it's going to make each process think that everything is always in the same place and that I own that memory area, while in fact um, everything can be shifted and um, things do not always happen to be in the same place. Um, and that concept is called virtual memory. We're going to look at the first technique to do virtualization, which is called base and bounds. That's the early, early, early days of doing multiprocessing um, and using virtual memory. And then we're going to add something to it and um, extend it beyond that to solve a few problems and um, introduce segmentation. So let's get our virtual memory discussion started. So can someone remind us what's on the address space of a process? Go back to, I think, I don't know, sessions five or six. Yeah, so what are the, there's four parts on the process's address space. What are those four parts? Yeah. yeah, so we got. Uh, let's make it an actual rectangle. So the way the, uh, the address of a process is organized is we have a section called code or text. We have a section called data that includes global, global variables. We have a section called heap. And this heap grows upwards. We have a section called the stack, and the stack goes, grows downwards. Okay, now the address space of process is nothing but these four memory segments. When we say the, this is the address space of a process, or a process is not allowed to access the address space of another, this means that you cannot add access the data section of another process or the heap section of another process and so on and so forth. And each process actually thinks that this starts, let's say, for at location zero, and this ends at location, um, I don't know, let's say it's F, F, F. So in its mind, the process always thinks that it owns the space, all zeros, up to all Fs in, in hex, basically, right? So we live under this illusion that we own the entire space. It's the same, same thing when you pick up the phone, right? When you call someone on a Wi-Fi, on, on, on a wireless network, you can, you, there's only two of you, you can hear each other, and you kind of live under the, the illusion that you know the entire telephone network is just made of you two. You don't hear anyone else's calls. You don't, your voice hopefully does not go to someone else um, and so on. So you live under the illusion that you own the network, but at the same time, there are multiple calls taking place. So we are doing something similar in here. We give the process the illusion that it owns everything, but in fact, 
everything is actually owned and organized by the operating system. So now the, the, the trouble comes in is, well, what if we want to support more than one single process? What if we want to create two processes at the same time? How are we going to organize them in memory? And how are we going to organize memory so that each process still thinks that it owns the zero to all apps? So let's take a look at that. So this is our main memory. And when we say my main memory, we usually refer to your RAM space. Okay, so we're going to assume that the operating system sit, sits on top and we're going to ignore the operating system from now. Let's assume it's, it's there, but we're not going to touch it. We're not going to do anything. I want to have two processes here. So this is process one. And when I have process two here. But in, in the eyes of process two, this is address zero, 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 zero. This is address F, F. And this is in the eyes of process one. This is address zero, 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 zero. This is address F, F, F. All right, so both processes, even though they're located in different areas in memory, so in fact, let's say this is address 100 and this is address, I don't know, um, 4096, let's say. So even though they both start at different locations, we want them to still think that they actually are in address space zero to all apps. And let's take a, let's see if, if in fact, this happens in real systems. So in here I have a small piece of code that is called test va. All this does, it mallocs something on the memory, it mallocs something on the heap of size 10, then it prints the address of that thing on the heap and the address, the address of the thing on the heap. Okay, so we have a is a pointer that points to an area of memory. We're going to print the value of A and the address of A. Okay, which are both addresses, um, but um, this is the address of an address, and this is the address of this memory. Yeah. So let's take a look at what happens when we do that. I think I already compiled this. So first thing you can see is that those two, they reside on different addresses. This is five, all fives, nine, two, A, zero, and this is seven F, D, F, six, eight. Do you have any ideas why they are in two different places? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so. Recall that we, when we use malloc, we go to the heap. When we declare something, it goes on the stack. So the actual variable A resides on the stack. So the address of A is something that's on the stack, but the content of A, it points to somewhere on the heap, which is you can tell by this being at 5.5 five something and this being at 7.5 something. So you can see that one of them is starting up there, one of them is starting um, a little bit down. So what happens now if I run two or three instances of this pro program? I'm just going to run, uh, run it three times. So here's the illusion that they live under. For the first one, the address of A, the same one as the address of A in the second one, same as the address of A in the third one. And even the address of the address of A is the same on all three processes. Even though they're running at the same time, they all think that A points to 555928A0 and A resides at location 7FFFDF6. So how is the operating system actually creating the, this illusion? is the goal of 
um, today in this lecture and the lectures that are going to come. come after. So let's go back to this figure. I'm going to take this one out. Let's go back to this figure. How do you think the operating system in the simplest ways? How do you think the operating system is actually providing this service for the processes? How is it making each of them think that it's always the same address? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what the um, process of doing base and bounds is. So I remember where the actual starting address of the process is. And then anything that any address that's sent to me is just an offset into that address. So I remember this guy. Let's use yellow. I remember this address, 4096. And for P2, address one is 4097, address two, 4099, and so on and so on. I don't know if that's visible. Yeah, get yeah, this. All right. So before we actually um, describe what base and bounds does, what we are actually doing here. Is, we, is what we call address translation, which is the process of taking a virtual address and translating it into a physical address. So we take what we, we call the address that the process has. So these addresses in here, all of these addresses, we call those virtual addresses. They're not actually used to index memory. What is actually used to index memory is the physical address, which is 4096, 4097, and so on. And that is what the operating system takes care of, translating your virtual address into an actual physical address. And all we're going to be talking about for the next few lectures is how this process of translation happens. We're going to start small. We're going to figure out what the problems are, but to solve those, we create new problems, we solve those, and so on and so on. OK? So let's take a look at what are the goals or requirements for address translation. So there are three things that we want to keep in mind when doing address translation. The first one is going to be efficiency. So I can't run a machine learning algorithm every time I translate a virtual address into a physical address, right? Because I get millions of these every time. And I can't run something that's super expensive um, in, that, in, the, in that space, right? I have to be as efficient as possible. And I also have to be as space efficient as possible, right? So in order to translate a virtual address to a um, physical address, I can't store a, you know, five megabyte lookup table. That defeats the purpose of me actually using memory at all. For every address or for every process, I have to have a lookup table that's big, then that's a problem, right? So efficiency is one of our um, requirements. Second requirement um, is going to be transparency. So what the transparency means is that the user process should not be aware of how things are happening. It only should be aware of the fact that I give you a virtual address, you give me data. I don't care how you did that. I don't want to see the physical addresses. I only want to see, want to give you an address, you give me the data, right? Imagine every time you have to make a phone call, you'd have to like set which 
towers are gonna route your phone call if you have to do that by hand, right? It's not, it's not, it's not practical. Um, all you have to do is just dial a number and then it goes on. So the third thing we want to talk about is protection. So protection means that if I'm making a phone call, no one else should be hearing that phone call. No one else should access it, should be accessing that phone call. And the same thing, I should not be accessing someone else's phone call. So in, 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 in analogous terms, a process's address space cannot be accessed by another app process unless specifically given permission through some APIs, through some shared memory, or through some type of um, process communication. Okay, so with those goals in mind, that is, let us now look at base and bound. So as in base and bound, as its name suggests, for each process, we maintain two things. One, which is a base register, and that is the start of the physical address of the process address space. Okay, so I always remember the starting address of each process's address space. And second, I remember a bound register which is the size of the address space so how big is the address space for a specific register okay so what do you think the formula is if i want to go from virtual address to physical address In terms of these two registers, what is the formula of going from the virtual address to the physical address? So how do we go from address, let's say five, into the corresponding address in this memory area. Yeah. Yep, we just add it to the base register. So the formula for this translation is simply physical address is equal to virtual address plus base or plus base register. And that's it. That's how we go from virtual address to a physical address. And as you notice, this is only one addition operation. And the nice thing about this, this is done in hardware. So I don't have to there is a specific memory management unit that does this translation for you. You give it an address, it calculates the physical address, and you're done. It's super fast, super efficient, and saves us a lot of time. The other thing we have to worry about is what if we access something that's out of bounds, that's outside the bounds of the memory area, the address space. So the one last thing we need to do is if the physical address is actually greater than the base plus bound, then we issue a segmentation problem. So you are trying to access memory 
that is not owned by you. And that is um, a requirement that we protect. Only accesses to valid memory are allowed. Accesses to memory you don't own or you did not allocate are not also allowed. OK, questions about base and bound approach. So if we want to take an example, the address 5 in here, the base register is going to be 4096. So translation is plus 5, which is going to be 5001. OK. And now that this is anytime you give me an address, I will just add it to that. Yeah. Yes. It's the operating. That's a good question. So the, the the entity that decides where the starting physical address is, and the entity that maintains these registers is the operating system. So you as a user, as you're not even aware of the presence of the base register. You're not even aware of the bound register. All you know that I give you give me an address, I give you a date. Okay. So that's the job of the operating system. Yeah. Um, whenever you're doing this, does the space of the each, like the space, because it goes from 0, 0, 0 to FFF or whatever, yes. that can't be the same size. Like, how do you determine that, like, how many, like, bytes that is? Because it can't be the same amount as the whole, like, address of the main register. Yes, that's, that's getting to one of the problems with this base and bound up approach, is that you have to know beforehand the size of how much bytes of memory you're going to need, right? Um, that's not always available because um, the whole point of dynamic memory is you allocate memory based on runtime values, right. right? So maybe you read the value from the user and you can't really tell me how big your, your data is. So we're going to see what, what problems that causes um, just a few seconds from now, OK? So if I want to move the, let's say I want to move P2 from here, and I want to put P2 here. Let's say this is larger than that. So let's say this is, assume this is equal to this guy. What's, what, what does moving a process from one location in physical memory to another location in physical memory entail? What do I need to do to make that happen? Yeah. Yeah, the only thing you have to do is adjust the base and the bounds of that register. You copy the data to the new location, you adjust the base and bounds, and you're done. The process itself still access, still requests memory address 5, so it does, it's not aware of this translation, right, of this move. Instead of it mapping to here, it then maps back down somewhere else because the base register has to. OK, so now we come to the problems with um, this approach. So first problem comes from the fact that processes require different sizes. Right? So let's take, and this leads to a problem that we call external fragmentation. So let's take a look at what this problem is through the following diagram. So assume this is our physical memory. <coughs> we have two processes in here. Each one occupies a hundred bytes. So assume for now that they're of the same size. Now comes in a third process. So this is P1, this is P2. This is a close up of P1, close up of P2. So P1 thinks this is 0 to 150, while this is in fact 100 to 250. 
process two thinks zero to this is also zero to one fifty. It's actually um, three hundred to four fifty. Now process three comes in and also requests a hundred bytes. So do you think we're going to be able to fit process three somewhere? So we have only 550 um, bytes available. Is there a place you can fit the 150 bytes or 150 bytes for process three? Yeah. Can you say that again? Oh, this, is, this is just free space. Just to illustrate that we have free space. So basically, the I don't know what this color is. The yellowish thing is the process, the actual process information. The white things are empty. So can we fit the um, third process coming in into our system? Yeah. So what's what's the what's the problem here? Do we have enough free space for it? But can we do, we can't really put it in that free space, right? Here's how much free space we have. We have a hundred bytes here. We have 50 bytes here and we have 100 bytes here. So we have 253 bytes. But we can't really, we don't have 150 contiguous bytes. So by placing things in these equal chunks and pre allocated chunks, we actually end up with this problem that we call external fragmentation, which means that we have the space to host a third process, but because the, the, the free space is fragmented, in different places, we can't really place the new process in there. Okay, so the 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 way to think about this is, let's say you have a, um, you know, you're double parking, and you have a space that fits two, three vehicles, but some very nice people come in and park, like they leave a little bit of free space here, um, a large free space in between them, and then a little bit of free space here, All right? So this is a typical problem if you come in from where I come from in the world, right? So you, you come to park, you see that there's space here, there's space here, there's space here. All three of them actually fit the car, but you can't really park because those two, not nice word, <laughs> park in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a really bad way, right? So this is a problem of, of fragmentation. Um, the other problem that we're going to face um, in when we're talking about base and bound registers is the problem of wasted space. So simply, it's basically the fact that when I allocate space for process P2, I actually am over allocating because I don't know how much stack and how much heap is it going to use. So the, pro the space between the stack and the heap. So this is the heap, this is the stack. This space is free space, right? So I have to over allocate that space in order to fit the process. So tomorrow we're gonna review these two problems and then we're gonna take a look at how we solve these issues through segmentation. So given that we weren't able to get to segmentation today, um, the activity for segmentation will be due on after next class. OK, so tomorrow you only have to submit yesterday's activity.